Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du Fred Astaire Revoir un latte I thank you for the opportunity for what you do. Herman, sorry, yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Well, your father Herman is looking down. He's very proud of you right well, he's now. Still alive. He's still huh? alive. Oh, he is. Well, then he's then he's even more proud. Of you. Then he's even more proud. With steel and aluminum workers on one side and a few surviving members of his economic team on the other, President Trump followed through this afternoon on his vow to set 25% tariffs on imported steel and 10% tariffs on imported aluminum. If the tariffs don't go effective for at least another 15 days. And we're going to see who's treating us fairly, who's not treating us fairly. Trump also said he was immediately exempting Mexico and Canada from the tariffs, at least temporarily. But many of his own party are sharply criticizing the president's decision, concerned about a potential trade war that damages the U.S. economy. Joining me here, Heather McGee, who is president of Demos Action, advocates economic policies to benefit working class families. And former iron worker Randy Bryce, a Democrat who is in the district challenging Paul Ryan in the 28 midterm election, though he does have a primary before he gets to that. It's good to have you both here. Um, I want to read for you Paul's, Paul Ryan statement on tariffs and get your response. Um, I disagree with this action, fear its unintended consequences. I am pleased the president has listened to those who share my concerns, including an exemption for some American allies, but it should go further. We will continue to urge the administration to narrow this policy so it is focused only on those countries and practices that violate trade law. It's pretty amazing that finally Paul Ryan comes to speak out against Donald Trump for, for anything. And he didn't do it when we were talking about mighty fine people on both sides um, in Charlottesville. He wasn't call, calling them out when we were talking about sexually assaulting women on a bus. Um, it, it says that, it, it tells me that they're, they're worried about their donor base and that this tax scam that was just recently passed is all going to go up in smoke. It is remarkable to watch them, like everyone get a conscience now about this, which again, like I don't think it's personally particularly good policy um but in the scope of what donald trump has done like they're really worked up about this grover norquist is like super upset <laughs> well that's the point and i think um randy said it really well you know follow the money with all of these issues the donor base has not been that upset about the racism and the sexism it, they know that it worked for him politically at least with you know the majority sadly um of white voters in this country and so they sort of tacitly are okay with that dog whistle strategy but they are not okay with him bucking the conservative economic orthodoxy. Now, I actually think that, you know, we shouldn't say that the sky is going to fall because of these tariffs, and I think it's actually a bad move for progressives to not understand that something needs to be done to stand up for American manufacturing, and I think yeah. it's actually kind of a trap for Democrats to, um, you know, to sort of follow Republicans into the, like, you know, the sky is falling. Yes, there. although it also seems there's a trap on the other side, which is to sort of decide that if Grover Norquist doesn't like something, you must. Right? Because well, that's the other thing. It's like, well, Grover Norquist and the donor class don't like this. Ergo, I'm all in on the steel and aluminum tariffs. But, but the good thing <laughs> is that progressives have been championing us having a real industrial policy for a long time. Like, actually, the Democrats put out a real infrastructure plan this week that would actually strengthen Buy America provisions. It would close the loopholes that 
you know, were just blown wide open in the GOP tax scam that encouraged companies to offshore their right. jobs so and profits. So there is a progressive vision for restoring some of American manufacturing and even more importantly for making the jobs that are here good jobs well, the same way that manufacturing jobs are turned into good jobs. And I think that's what we need to make an important point. Who is this being done for? Is it for the American worker? No, because the American worker, the way that it's set up now, or we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be the ones paying more for this tariff. If you're serious about having some kind of help with the steel industry, we should have done something a long time ago when, like, Bethlehem Steel was was really doing something good. Right. Um, now we're talking about reopening some shops. I read about one reopening in in Illinois. It's going to take months to get that even started, and. You know, whoa, the CEO of that company, does he really put his trust in, in Donald Trump right. to go and hire that's a factory a, full of people to come and work only to have to lay him off in a couple of months? That's that's an interesting point. Does this does this play in your district, though? I'd imagine it does. To, to an extent, it does. But right now, I mean, the first district used to be a manufacturing center, had a lot of uh, car jobs. Those are all gone. And now we have a lot of retirees now that are pretty ticked off that all their jobs are gone and there's, there hasn't been anything to replace. Uh, what about, there's this, the, I want to ask one more follow-up, which is Harley-Davidson is in your district, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, right? So the EU basically said, in response to this, we're going to go after Bourbon from Kentucky, Mitch right. McConnell, and we're going to go after Harley-Davidson from Paul Ryan's district. Like, if that were to happen, what would, what would that mean for you? And what would that mean for the people in the district in terms of how they understand what's happening? Well, just the fact that, I, I mean, we can't, Imagine Harley Davidson being gone. You know, a right. few years ago we built a museum, um, but that's just another another aspect of, of American workforce that that's being neglected and being you know like a poker chip in in this big right. grand scheme that they're playing. And and it shouldn't be like that. It should, we're, we've had too much too much time where the American worker has been neglected. Do you worry about where the economic policy of this administration goes now? Because for so long it really was just donor class art orthodoxy. Now he does this, and then it's like, well, it's really anyone's guess well or maybe not i don't know well it's, i mean i think that's a good question right i mean there's always been this faux populism and yet he committed to a couple of big things he said i'm going to do a big infrastructure policy which again if it was actually an infrastructure plan instead of a, an excuse to sell off america's assets to right. the highest bidder which is what he un unveiled a month or so ago then you know you would actually see potentially a major political realignment to where you could say that a Republican president did more for the working and middle class and to invest in our economy right. and our infrastructure than, you know, a Democrat was allowed to with right. the Republican Congress for six years. But I actually think that this little gesture is a weak gesture. Um, something that would be much more powerful would be something that he doesn't want to do, which is let the dollar actually fall back into alignment, because that's not a strong dollar, and he doesn't yeah. like things that aren't strong, literally. And so you're not going to get sort of a rational, effective economic policy out of this president. Right, and it may all, as you said, that's a great point about, like, if you're planning, if you're a CEO planning on this, like, who knows if it goes away in two weeks, once the last person in the room, Mike Pence, talks him out of it, which makes, I mean, again, it, it relates back to the North Korea meeting, too, like, yeah. Who knows in two weeks about any of this? Heather McGee and Randy Bryce, thank you both for being here. It is Friday, the 9th of February of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Our daily special is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, folks, because we are all Nighthawks in the diner of life. Well, uh, we got lucky. Looks like it won't be until May until uh, Trump can negotiate us to, well, about the brink of collapse. So we're pretty lucky that way. A little bit of a delay. It, uh, I got to tell you, this entreaty from North Korea it came just at the right time, too. Uh, Manafort had been indicted uh, or, or had to plead in his case. And uh, usually these, uh, these uh, notes... When passed between these kind of leaders, usually say um, open only if the Mueller probe is really closing in. So I, I don't know. Seems interesting in, in its timing. But at least we have until May. So we're f we have to wait until May for the world to, well, get right to the brink. Why not have a good trade war now? And that's what we opened with. Uh, here at the uh, Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, indeed. 
a trade war. Yeah, steel and aluminum tariffs. Yee. Even even the union guy, Randy Bryce. Oh, he, you know, of course, he's running against Paul Ryan. <laughs> Boy, wouldn't that be a difference? And uh, even he was saying, look, I mean, what we're talking about are a couple of boutique steel shops. We're not talking about an industry here. But uh, I'll say it again. If you were a hostile foreign power, wouldn't you want to weaken every aspect of what it is that is America? Okay. I'm telling you, it's just like an Independence Day. They're moving their chess pieces all over the board, and pretty soon it's going to be checkmate. Let's not let it happen. Okay, what's on the rest of the menu? Well, we'll just have to tell you, won't we? Republicans just priced out a third of America from health insurance. Yeah. Uh, Of course, that was uh, by design. (laughs) I mean, why not? Chris Kobach, yeah, the Kansas miracle. Hmm. Well, he's turned a landmark voting rights case into a comedy of fumbling questions. Misplaced documents, errors of omission, and lessons from the judge in basic civil procedure. He wants to tell you how to vote, but he doesn't know how to file a deposition. And the Trump appointee reshaping the census has a long history of voter suppression. I told you. You know, move your chess pieces here, move your chess pieces there. Oh, boy. Well, uh, that's in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy today. But then, after the break, we'll move to the chef's table, where we'll not only go over weather from around the world, but we're going to discuss that white tourist trap of Branson, Missouri. They're going to hold a Hispanic 101 class to try to figure out their Latino workers. Okay. Yeah, I got a lot of Puerto Ricans displaced. Why Puerto Ricans will want to go to Missouri is beyond me. But you got to go somewhere. And Pope Francis has cleared the way for Archbishop Oscar Romero. Of course, you know, he's the advocate for the poor liberation th- theology. You know, the guy who was slain in 1980 by right-wing death squads in El Salvador while he was serving mass. Yeah, Pope Francis has uh, cleared the way so that Archbishop Oscar Romero can become a saint. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is provided by Frances Living's, a fabulous, wonderful ingenue out of Southern California, and she performs all over the Southland, so check her out. Uh, if you go to the bottom of our homepage at netroosradio.com, you notice the chat room link on the rightish, and you'll notice the donate, contribute to buttons on the leftish. And thank you for your generosity. That's how we pay our bills. And uh, you can uh, uh, find show notes and links as well as links to Frances Living's work so that you can purchase her work. That would be nice. Uh, on my Daily Co's diary and I can be found there as Justice Putnam and I can be found on Twitter and uh, at, at Justice Putnam just how it sounds. And uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Kelly Lincoln takes care of the chat room and uh, monitors that and takes care of the Facebook page somewhat. But, uh, you know, I kind of post uh, links for show notes there as well. Tom takes care of Twitter. So follow Netroots Radio on Twitter. And uh, that would be nice also. And do that. Okay. I know there's something else that I'm supposed to say. But, oh, 
podcasts of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, as well as the Justice Department Music Sans Frontières, Music Without Borders, can be had by way of Spreaker. Yeah. And uh, you can also find podcasts of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on on uh, TuneIn, Stitcher. Uh, let's see. We have a YouTube channel. So go to Netroots Radio and uh, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy will be there. And, well, wherever fine podcasts can be found. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to mention a little bit about uh, uh, this Dana Lush. Lush. I'm sorry. Dana Lush. It should be Lush. Uh, she got taken to task by Linda Torado, who we interviewed uh, a couple years ago. I, I think when her first book came out. You know, hand to mouth. And uh, she's laid down the gauntlet to Dana Lush. It sounds like high noon at, uh, you know, right outside the saloon. Oh, man. Don't mess around with someone who actually, you know, has lived the life. Dana Lush. Jeez. Okay. So that's interesting and uh, good for Linda. I, you know, she she knows from whence she speaks. Oh, let's see. The VA secretary is so fearful of his own staff that he posted an armed guard. <laughs> That's great. He's posted an armed guard outside of his uh, office because he's so afraid of his own staff. The VA secretary. Okay, well, I don't know. I've never heard of a Veterans Affairs secretary getting fragged. But there's always a first time. I mean, this presidency just, there's no end to what can happen. All right. Kushner's Middle East policy point man was indicted for child pornography in the 80s. Well, what else is new? I mean, come on. These guys are all pedophiles. What? I mean, who would run a teenage beauty pageant anyway and walk in on the girls? Oh, okay. Well, so much going on. Let's see. Oh, U.S. court to weigh Republican challenge to Pennsylvania voter redistricting, which goes right up into uh, some of our stories today. All right. Well, uh, so much news, and we'll have to catch up. <laughs> we never will uh, on Monday, but because there's going to be something that happens that's going to supersede everything that's happening right now. Oh, I did also one more thing before we go to uh, the curated stories for today. The uh, Soviet ex-spy, uh, or Russia spy, Sergei Skripal. Um, well, the UK has deployed a military probe now in the nerve agent attack on he and his daughter. Uh, this is quite a story in Great Britain because they, you know, they don't take kindly to hostile foreign powers coming into uh, their country and, you know, messing things up. Not like here where it's encouraged. OK, so uh, all you MAGA people out there talking about your patriotism. Yeah, you don't. <laughs> it's a uh, well, I'll just say this. It's an odd kind of patriotism when your loyalty is not to the great experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Speaking of no, no loyalty to the great experiment. Uh, one of the Bundys might be aiming, uh, you know, cause they got the, they somehow skipped out on the charges, skipped out. They had a jury nullification in Oregon. And, uh, then something weird happened when in their case where they, you know, had a small army and drew down on federal, uh, agents. <laughs> you can get away with that now. Weird, isn't it? Uh, he's going to run for office and make Nevada a whole sovereign state. And I, I, that sounds like wh how, how did uh, how did Jeff Sessions put, put, put it? That sounds like C session. C session. That's what Jeff Sessions calls secession. C session sounds suspiciously like C section, and which says everything we need to know about Jeff Sessions. C sessions. All right, let's get to our curated stories. Enough of this hoopla. Okay, third of America priced out of health insurance by the Republicans. New, uh, let's see, 
third of America, according to a new study. This is by Dan Desai Martin out of uh, ShareBlue Media. Obamacare premiums are set to increase by up to 94% in the next three years. With the brunt of the impact centered on middle-class Americans. Yesterday we talked about the fee increases to go to uh, uh, national parks and monuments. Like to go to Yosemite, it's going to cost 70 bucks up from 25, 30 bucks now. And all sorts of other little fees tacked on, you know, Um, if you have a trailer, you got to pay that. If you want to see a certain feature in the park, you got to pay extra for that. I think I'm pretty sure there's a there's a breathing fee. You want to breathe in the national park? There will be a fee for that. What's your estimated time here? We'll we'll amateurize it and charge you at the end. Okay. Well, you know, what do you expect if you're going to run a government like business? So uh, the, the point being is that they are overpricing the admission fees to these parks because they're trying to keep people from going there so that they can take it over and then extract whatever minerals or, you know, they want. So here, uh, apparently Obamacare is, you know, for all of its faults, considering it is, let's be clear, a Russian, a Russian, excuse me, that was a Freudian slip. I meant Republican. Is there a difference? It's a Republican plan, even right down to the individual mandate that the Republicans hate so much. Well, I've always said they're self-hating. That's why they do what they do. Okay, so the middle class is going to be priced out of insurance. And, uh, of course, it's going to be highest in conservative states because you always hurt the ones that love you the most. That's the Republican, I don't know, genetics. Uh, Oh, boy, am I going to get in trouble for saying that because not all Republicans are like that. Richard Painter, he's going to run in uh, Franken's old, old seat as a Republican. And you better remember, I mean, he takes, boy, he takes Trump to task. It's no holds barred, and he's Texas all through and through the way he says it. So he's running in Minnesota, but, you know, let's not not forget, Richard Painter is a Republican, and he was the ethics chief for G.W. Bush. You remember G.W. Bush, right? He was the guy that, uh, you know, uh, his his ethics and legal staff said that, uh, you know, uh, torturing people at secret black sites— Holding people indefinitely in Guantanamo without being charged. Even crushing the testicles of a small kid just to get his dad to talk. All of that was considered legal and ethical. So Richard Painter, you know, I mean, come on. Of course, people say, well, Mueller will ferret it out. And I've got to tell you, I mean, Mueller's a Republican. He knows these people. He knows them pretty damn good. So after years of Republicans falsely claiming Obamacare was in a death spiral, they set out to dismantle one of the most successful changes to public health policy in generations because a black guy did it. All right. The number of uninsured Americans dropped by 20 million people since Obamacare passed 2010. But now, you know. So Republicans made outlandish promises to make health care better for Americans, yet their failed attempts to fully repeal it in 2017 would have made health care dramatically worse. Yeah, geez. Undeterred because rust never sleeps, and these Republicans are very corrosive. Let's not forget that either. Well, they found other ways to implement disastrous policy changes. We're going to starve it until it's the size of a, you know, fit in a bathtub. In particular, the tax ca- scam contained provisions meant to destabilize Obamacare. Well, of course. The study now, which looked at premiums for the ACA health plans, revealed 17 states are at risk of seeing premium increases of 90% or more. An additional 19 states are at risk of cumulative increases of 50% or more. Wow, that's quite a few of the states in the nation. 
And then all remaining states face cumulative increases of at least 36% of far cry from Republican promises of lower health care costs. They're not trying to lower the costs. They're trying to get you to buy junk insurance policies again, which they're, I, I don't know. I think Idaho is now precluded from doing that by law. Republicans promised a, promised a better way on health care. Instead, the laws and policies implemented by Republicans are making it far, far worse. And like I say, it is a feature, not a bug. Here, a learner from Think Progress penned this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Would you like a perno? Well, at one point in federal court on Tuesday, Judge Julie Robinson gave Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach and his co-counsel a lesson they should have learned before deciding to defend themselves against the ACLU in a landmark voting rights case that could affect the future of how Americans register to vote. I am not going to allow anybody to testify to a document that's not in evidence, she said. Evidence 101. I am not going to do it, she scolded. Uh Uh-oh. Now, that wasn't the only time the judge, a George W. Bush appointee, would explain to Kobach and his fellow attorneys the basic legal concepts after they fumble the rules of evidence and civil procedure. During the first two days of trial, Judge Robinson also walked Kobach's team through how to phrase questions in cross-examination, how to impeach a witness, and how to present new exhibits into the record. This guy's Secretary of State. You would think he would know something about the law. No. The know-nothings have a stranglehold, apparently. The least you know, the more exalted you are. And I've had that argument presented to me. If you are unfettered by all this pollution of knowledge, you have a direct channel from God in which he, and it's always a he, can direct you. Excuse me. Okay. Well, the Republican Secretary of State, who is also running for governor of Kansas, decided to represent himself. And you know a fool for a client. Okay. It's unclear why Kobach decided to handle the case himself rather than being represented by the Kansas Attorney General's office, which would have numerous attorneys skilled at trial advocacy or another attorney with trial experience. All right. Well, uh, apparently even the other side feels sorry for him. He, they're, they're bumbling so much. And, and the counsel that he has with them, with him, apparently have never had any trial experience whatsoever at, at any level. Well, like I said, the argument was put to me that if you were unfettered by the pollution of knowledge... You know better and more than the rest of us.
finishing up here on the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, is, uh, ooh, I'm sorry, here we go, is a article out of Alter, I'm sorry, out of ProPublica by Justin Elliott. In December, the Department of Justice requested that the Census Bureau add a question to the 2020 survey that would ask respondents to reveal whether or not they are U.S. citizens. Since ProPublica first reported the DOJ's letter, civil rights groups and congressional Democrats have announced their opposition, arguing that in the midst of Trump's immigration crackdown, the question will lead many people to opt out of the census, resulting in an inaccurate population count. The census is a very important part of our governing. In fact, it's even put in the Constitution. So a lot is at stake. The once-in-a-decade population count determines how house seats are distributed and helps determine where hundreds of billions of federal dollars are spent. Well, Trump and his crew want it spent, I don't know, maybe converted back into rubles so they can spend it outside of Gorky Park somewhere. I hear the restaurants are very exclusive. But one question regarding the December letter remained unclear. The letter was signed by a career staffer in a division of the DOJ whose main function is handling budget and procurement matters. Who, observers wondered, was actually driving this policy change? Well, the letter was drafted by a Trump political appointee after a Freedom of Information Act request was finally granted to ProPublica. And this guy's best known for his work defending Republican Republican gerrymandering efforts around the country. John Gore, who since last summer has been the acting head of the DOJ Civil Rights Division, notice how the people who are adamant against the policies that have been, I don't know, the foundations of our of our standard of governing, the ones who have argued in tearing these things apart are now in, in charge of these departments. Almost like it was a plan. Okay, so uh, last summer had been the acting head of the DOJ Civil Rights Division, drafted the original letter to the Census Bureau. In one email, Arthur Gary, the career official who signed the letter, noted that it was sent, quote, at the request of leadership working with John. Okay, Gore comes from uh, the law firm Jones Day, where he was an appellate specialist best known for defending a range of Republican state gerrymandering plans that were attacked as racial gerrymandering by opponents. For example, uh, Gore helped defend a Virginia gerrymander that was ultimately thrown out by the court, which ruled that legislators had focused too much on race. Are you an American citizen? Are you a white American citizen is really what they want to be asking. Okay, so uh, uh, the stated reason for adding a citizenship question to change congressional apportionment contrasts with a December letter from the Department of Justice to the Census Bureau. That letter argues that more data on U.S. citizens is needed to better enforce the Voting Rights Act, which they're trying to dismantle under C. Sessions. All right, let's get to our break, and we'll come back, go, uh, go through weather from around the world, and finish up finish up with our stories curated for the chef's table. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, Mother Meets Rival. The term annihilation has a meaning in particle physics, and it underlies existence as we know it. Transfer to genetics, and such are the stakes in Alex Garland's latest, Annihilation. 
Living up to the elegant minimalism we saw in his Ex Machina, the setup for the story is simply what looks like a meteor striking a lighthouse in what appears to be the Gulf Coast region. Around this strike, an area develops called the Shimmer, due to photo-optic effects that surround it and into which expeditions go but do not return. Authorities speculate as to whether expedition members are being killed or going crazy and killing each other, which is certainly an effective setup for the action. As the film opens, cellular biologist Lena's husband, Kane, returns from a military operation where he'd been presumed KIA, remembering nothing before passing out and then being taken into custody on the way to hospital. The film also ends with Lena and Kane in custody in a government medical facility, but only after a bizarre, non-linear story documenting Lena and the team's journey into the shimmer. It would be easy in a film like this to allow the beautiful and the grotesque, woven into what might be the strangest horror escape you'll ever see, to supplant character development. But Natalie Portman's Lena, Jennifer Jason Lee's Dr. Ventress, the expedition leader, and other members of the all-female team have credible backstories, all of which more or less fit into the theme of distortion and destruction of heretofore unsuspected underpinnings of science and life. Annihilation is the eponymous adaptation of the first of Jeff Van Demeer's Southern Reach novel trilogy, so the sense of inconclusion you'll have coming out of this one is probably as it should be. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. Welcome to 60 Second Civics from the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. When laws or governmental actions conflict with a citizen's views of what is right and wrong, the citizen faces a difficult decision. In our system of government, you have a right to try to have laws changed. There are many ways that you and others can work to change laws that you think are unjust. Until you get them changed, however, you are held responsible for obeying the laws. But suppose a law requires you to do something you believe is wrong. Must you obey the law? Some people argue that since no government is perfect, a citizen's responsibility to obey the law has limits. In their view, if a law is unjust, the citizen has no responsibility to obey it. However, deciding to disobey the law has consequences that the citizen must be prepared to accept. Such consequences might include paying fines and even going to jail. Throughout history, many citizens have accepted the consequences of disobeying the law. For example, during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s, Martin Luther King Jr., Fred Shuttlesworth, Rosa Parks, and many others chose to go to jail to protest racial segregation laws. Their sacrifices spurred legislation that eventually dismantled segregation. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor special report recorded on March 8, 2018. I'm Seamarie Ainsborough. International Women's Day, March 8, is a day set aside to assess the progress of women as they struggle for their human rights to be respected, fairness in the workplace, and an equal role in determining the future of humankind. That's the central message of the organization which represents working people at the world level. The International Trade Union Confederation, the ITUC, represents national union centers such as the AFL-CIO in the United States and the Ghana Trades Union Congress. These centers include 176 million workers in 162 countries. Sharon Burrow is the General Secretary of the ITUC. In a recent panel discussion held in Davos, Switzerland, she was asked about the future of women in the workplace and society in general. If you build a future that actually doesn't include women as equals, then we are going to create more of the same, and it's unsustainable. It's unjust, of course, it's immoral, but it's actually unsustainable. When you look at the fact that, you know, women in the workforce, if they were in there in equal numbers, the growth that everybody's seeking and the productivity would be achieved like that. If you invested in care so that women could, in fact, join the workforce, plus you get decent jobs in care and a 4% dividend for men from the infrastructure and services spin-off, 
then we'd be changing the world. And that's not even going to the fact that uh, despite the, that it's the importance of equal numbers of CEOs and board members, in the world I come from, every indicator shows that progress women are stagnating. And I meet the women like Yishi in Ethiopia last week, paid $20 a month in a textile industry, which is the next wave of low cost, low tech manufacturing in an old uh, world uh, production cycle. And that's disgusting. You know, our companies could pay four times that and they'd pay less than Bangladesh. And you all know the story of Bangladesh. And of course, women are the face of uh, domestic slavery. They're the majority of uh, women in the informal economy. No minimum wage, no rights, no rule of law. So we've got a lot of work to do. Ms. Burrow was asked about the rise of powerful men, such as Donald Trump. The rise of the alpha male mm. has unleashed a wave of misogyny that's not new. Mm. We fought for us, a very young woman in the 70s, but we fought for the legislation, the sex discrimination commissioners, the, you know, the rule of law, the, the reporting of businesses. But what we didn't do was fight the silence. And that allowed a power of intimidation and bullying that's mm-hmm. perpetuated it. What I say about women, and I'm, I'm delighted about the Me Too piece, because it does allow people to speak out. But we have to have a bigger message than that. Women have power. What we don't need is male leaders or male uh, CEOs or male trade union leaders or whatever institution to tell women they can have power. We need to make sure that women's voices are heard. Ms. Burrow points out the women are not an isolated group. They are part of a wider society which is experiencing problems such as unemployment, inequality and technological change. The world needs to negotiate a new social contract. We need to change the rules. 85% of the world's people in our global polling tell us they want the rules of the economy, the global economy, rewritten. Why? Because they're, they're the people dealing with the historic inequality, the global wages slump, the massive unemployment, the deep anxiety about jobs for themselves and, and for their children. And indeed, of course, it's women and women workers who face the consequences of misogyny, of uh, sexual harassment, of incredible levels of violence against women in our societies and in our workplaces. And climate devastation. Again, it's working people who are on the front lines of both the loss of uh, lives and livelihoods as seasons change or you have massive events. And that's what the economy is based on. As much as the CEOs are important and the investors are important, without working people, you simply wouldn't have an economy. And it's today's working people who are actually part and parcel of a global workforce in trouble. Human beings bought us this fractured world. We built this fractured world. We need to learn some lessons and rebuild on the basis of a common humanity, a common solidarity. I'm C. Marie Ainsborough. Thank you for listening. From United Nations headquarters in New York, this is your World in Two Minutes. I'm your host, Luke Vargas, for Talk Media News. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is in Africa this week, and he's sounding the alarm about the increasingly apparent risks caused by Chinese investment on the continent. We are not in any way attempting to keep Chinese investment dollars out of Africa. They are badly needed. However, we think it's important that African countries carefully consider the terms of those investments. Tillerson said China rarely hires local workers for infrastructure projects, offers few job training programs for locals, and he warned that the terms of Chinese loans are often so bad that the sovereignty of African countries can come under threat in the event of a default. Joshua Messervy is a senior policy analyst for Africa at the Heritage Foundation. About a third of these debts or loans are collateralized with natural resources. So that means either that they have to pay back in natural resources or in in the event of a default, they might have to surrender control of a strategic asset. Making matters worse, Messervy said there's increasing evidence China may be targeting financially unsteady African countries in a cynical ploy to attain strategic assets through defaults. 
Given the economically dubious nature of many Chinese infrastructure projects, he said it's unlikely the U.S. or many global banks will offer better loan terms to Africa, but he applauded Tillerson for sounding the debt alarm nonetheless. I think Tillerson is doing pretty much all the U.S. can do at this point, which is to speak as a friend to these African countries and say, hey, China is offering you all this easy money and these loans, and that's appealing in the short term, but you have to look 10, 15, 20 years down the road and think about what this means for your sovereignty. Think about, can you actually repay these loans? And if you can't, the Chinese have you over a barrel. Luke Vargas, the United Nations. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Yes, indeed. French 77, that's a good one, too. Maybe a little too early in the morning for it, but it's always nice time of day somewhere in the world. Okay, so uh, now that you are... Uh, comfortably ensconced at the chef's table here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Let me get the uh, weather forecast opened up here. And uh, all right, so weather from around the world. And we always begin along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the West Coast. It is currently 45 degrees. We will have uh, about the same temperature that we had yesterday. Upper 50s, low 60s, though with rain all day. Yes. Uh, Expecting, well, let's see. Okay, we're expecting almost an inch of rain from this little splatter. And that will continue through the day, decreasing somewhat tonight. Uh, So let's see, what do we have here? Okay, winds light and variable out of the east-northeast currently. And uh, seems like they will continue with that, uh, though picking up to the regular 5 to 10 miles per hour at the appropriate times when the sun go- comes really up and when the sun goes really down. We like that. And air quality is good at 22 parts per million, a little bit up from yesterday. Pressure is holding steady at 29.94 inches. Visibility is down to 3 miles. Humidity, 94%. And uh, so, yeah, we'll have uh, uh, rain showers, and that that means real rain. When we set, when we call it showers here in Oregon, it is. And uh, that will continue through the day, decreasing a bit tonight. Uh, uh, possibility of rain in, uh, through the weekend, and then picking up with more showers around Tuesday. So. Okay, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people live around the world. Yeah, it's like a crowdsource. London is 48 with rain showers. Paris is uh, 57 and fair. Rome is 59 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 35 with light rain. Uh, Kabul is 41 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 51 and clear. Tokyo, 45 with rain. Sydney, Australia, 69 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California, 47 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York, 36 degrees Fahrenheit and mostly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased these people planted these personal weather stations somewhere on their property and these people live around the world Did you hear? 
hear that Obama is in negotiations with Netflix for uh, a TV show? Uh, that That's something. I, I hope he calls it uh, Two Ferns and a President. I would say I'd be here all week, but the week's up. So, you know, <laughs> you'll have to catch me again on Monday. In between that time, why don't we uh, get into this uh, white Missouri tourist trap, Branson, Missouri. Holds an Hispanic 101 class to figure out as Latino workers. This is by Noor Al-Sabai out of Ross Story. The Missouri town that boasts the Titanic Museum, Ripley's Believe It or Not, and Dolly Parton Stampede Dinner Attraction hosted a Hispanics 101 class aimed at learning how to understand their, their Latino workforce. Okay, Thursday, that was yesterday, the town of Branson, Missouri, was strapped with a 10% unemployment rate in the tourism-based economy when they began recruiting workers from another area with high jobless population, Puerto Rico. Nevertheless, some of Branson's 11,400 residents have the usual racist fears that the influx of Puerto Ricans would lead to lower wages, crime, and violence. When you're a jet, you're a jet all the way. To learn how to relate to their workers from a different culture, employers in Branson paid $40 a head to attend a Hispanics 101 workshop led by self-described millennial advocate and human resources disruptor Miguel Joey Avalis. Okay. Hosted by the Branson Tri-Lakes Human Resources Association, the class promised the town's employers that he would teach tangible strategies and tools to understand the fundamental characteristics of Hispanic culture and their implications in the workforce. All right. Explain, explain Day of the Dead. Employers in Branson... I have many Confederate flag-adorned shop windows and a billboard touting White Pride Radio. They were encouraged to ask their Latino employees about their mothers and request that grocery stores in the area sell plantains and Goya coconut water. Wow. How about, you know, they got barbecue there. How about some carnitas? Come on, get them to serve some carnitas. Jesus. If you're going to go full-blown, go full-blown. The need for the class in the town that's more than 90% white, it appears, was not unfounded. Juanita Vasquez, a 35-year-old woman originally from San Juan, who is the general manager at a luxury resort, told the Washington Post that after Hurricane Maria, she heard a guest at the hotel disparage the humanitarian crisis the storm created. Why are we giving money to Puerto Rico, the man said over breakfast. They are so lazy. Uh-huh. Isn't that typical? Down the sea, maintenant, sous l'été, les pieds nus dans le sable. Danser maintenant Et jeter vos ennuis dans les vagues Qui dansent Ballon Okay, finishing up here in the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays Is an article out of the LA Times by Kate Linthicum Linthus, yeah, Linthicum Tracy Wilkinson and Tom Kington. Now, uh, Pope Francis has cleared the way for Archbishop Ros Oscar Romero to become a saint. Well, the Vatican said on Wednesday that Francis considered Romero a model for the Roman Catholic Church and had approved a miracle attributed to the Archbishop, a requisite for canonization. It said Francis had also approved a miracle for Pope Paul VI, which means he too can be elevated to sainthood. Well, you know, you got <laughs> you got the Polish Pope and you got Oscar Romero. Really uh, two ends of the spectrum there. I guess it balances it out in the scales of uh, heavenly justice. 
The news comes after years of efforts by church conservative to, conservatives to block Romero's canonization because they opposed his leftist political views. It was celebrated, of course, in El Salvador, where the gulf between the rich and the poor remains as wide as ever, and where Romero's unflinching advocacy for the downtrodden still resonates with the masses. I was in Honduras, I uh, mentioned this before, working for an NGO, uh, drilling water wells for schools. I had some experience in, in the drilling industry, shall we say. And uh, uh, that was during the time of Oscar Romero's liberation theology, which was uh, a very powerful uh, message of empowerment to the poor and downtrodden, which just cannot be, you know, cannot stand in uh, in societies where the economic gulf between rich and poor is so wide. Uh, you don't want the poor to be empowered. There's a lot of them, and only a few of you. So, uh, okay, of course, many people in El Salvador already consider Romero a saint. About 250,000 Salvadorans turned out for his beatification ceremonies in 2015, with some donning T-shirts declaring him Saint Romero. Born in the rural corner of El Salvador, the priest began his career in the church as a relative conservative, but years of seeing how El Salvador's poor were mistreated by a handful of rich oligarchs turned him against the elite. He was killed with a bullet through the heart while saying mass in a hospital chapel in 1980. Just as El Salvador's civil war was heating up, pitting leftist rebels against a right-wing military dictatorship backed by the United States. Okay, Romero spoke out against the military's harsh tactics in his homilies and radio broadcasts. That angered the military by writing to President Jimmy Carter to ask that the U.S. stop military aid to El Salvador. Shortly before his death, Romero delivered a sermon begging Army soldiers to not obey orders to kill civilians. And so they decided to obey orders and kill the priest. Not just the priest, the archbishop. Then at his funeral, the army opened fire, killing dozens of mourners. That incident and his death were seen as key events at the start of the 12-year civil war, in which 75,000 people were killed and thousands disappeared. Now, of course, conservatives in the church argued that, oh, he can't be a saint because you got to have two miracles, two miracles. And he said, yeah, but he was martyred. Oh, no, he wasn't killed because of his faith. He was killed because of his politics. Which I got to tell you, in liberation theology is you know pretty closely entwined. So uh, the miracle that cleared the way for Romero's sainthood concerned the medically inexplicable cure of a pregnant, terminally ill Salvadoran woman who was condemned to death by illness but lived and gave birth to a healthy child. Okay, so miracles can still happen. Apparently the woman's husband began praying to Romero in May of 2015, so, you know, you can perform these miracles even after death, which is a good thing if, you, you know, if you're going to be canonized as a saint. So, now, I got to tell you, I studied for the priesthood, albeit very briefly, when I was but a mere child, a novitiate. Okay, uh, for Salvadoran church go churchgoer uh, Josefa Treos, the news of Romero's pending canonization only confirmed what she had long believed. The Pope is giving us a blessing with this news, but St. Romero is already on the altars. He is already miraculous and a saint. And if you were ever fortunate enough to have heard a Romero sermon and understood it in Spanish. Uh, he was quite the man and a great man. And to be canonized, uh, look, he's raised to the Academy of Good People, and well, he should. Okay, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but we'll be back here on Monday for River City Ash Mondays. Yes, indeed. And uh, we'll have some great programming through the weekend. Check out uh, the Roundtable Roundhouse Power Hour with Ricky and Kelly on Saturday night. My music show, uh, the Justice Department Music Sound Frontier, is on Sunday night. Check the schedule. 
And uh, stay tuned to Netroots Radio throughout because there's breaking news and you'll be caught up on all of our live programming as well. So, so stay tuned for that. And we will meet up with you on Monday in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. La pluie de novembre, tes mains qui coulent, je n'en peux plus de t'attendre. Les années passent, qu'il est loin, là je tombe. Nul ne peut nous entendre. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère. Voir un latte coël, je voudrais toujours te plaire dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je veux déjeuner par terre, comme au long de golfe clair, t'embrasser les yeux ouverts dans mon jardin d'hiver. Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver